go. Okay, I think we're live. I think we're on. Is anybody there? If you are there, can you please say hello in the chat box uh, and tell us where you're from uh, and also what, uh, what time is it exactly? What time is it exactly where you are? If you can hear me, that is. If there's anybody in this room or am I sh shouting into a cave? Is there anyone there? Yes, Alexandra, you're first in. Kien from Vietnam, lovely to see you. Jay from Thailand, raid 3.50 p.m. Thank you very much for the specificity raid, much appreciated. Good stuff, oh, that's great, you're all here. Great to see you, hello, hello, hello. So we've got 7.50 in Bangkok, 8.50, don't know, in a very mysterious place, unknown place. Um, Sandy from Vietnam. Uh, okay, again, so if, in case you've only just this second arrived, what time is it? What time is it? Exactly what time is it where you are? So I'm based in the UK uh, and the time here is 13.51. And I'm going to put it in the chat box as well. So Will from the UK, whoops, never mind, 13.51. 7.51 in Vietnam. 7.51 in the evening, lovely. Well, thank you very much for joining. Thank you so much. It's lovely to see you all. From all over the world as well. We've got Czech Republic, we've got Thailand. I want to see how far east and how far west we can go. We've got Thailand, I think that's winning at the moment that way. Spain is winning the other way. Uh, no, Vietnam is winning, is winning on the east, on the east hemisphere. Uruguay, okay, okay. Well, uh, Uruguay takes takes the prize, I think, for being the furthest west. Lovely. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, okay, so my name is Will Rickson. Uh, I am teacher training manager at uh, Macmillan Education, almost forgot that, teacher training manager at Macmillan Education, and I'm here to welcome you to uh, the very first advancing learning uh, roundtable discussion. And as you've all registered and come here today, I'm sure you already know that the subject for today's discussion is education for sustainable development and citizenship. So there's going to be sort of three separate areas which we're going to be talking about. I won't go into too much detail, but we're, we're looking at global citizenship education, we're looking at diversity, equity and inclusion, and we're looking at sustainability, and we're sort of looking at that within the ELT realm, within the area of ELT, within the classroom, within the industry, within the teacher themselves, within the students, um, so it should be a really fantastic discussion. And very, very soon I'm going to stop um, babbling on, and I'll introduce you to all of the speakers, they'll be coming back on in a minute. In the meantime, I just wanted to take care of a few extremely important things, which um, I'm sure you want to hear about. So I hope you can see that. Very much hope you can see that. I still want to see the chat, so I'm going to move the chat. I'm going to pop the chat out so I can see you. OK, so welcome. And uh, first thing I want to let you know about is before you ask, I'm sure you will want to know this, but I'm going to tell you now, we'll tell you again at the end, uh, it might even come up during the session as well, but you will be receiving uh, an email from us, uh, most likely tomorrow, but maybe early next week. So please be patient, it's going to come in the next few days. Um, it takes a bit of time to, for this email to, be, to, to go out to you, so please be patient. Check your spam folder as well, your junk mail, uh, sometimes it goes in there. Uh, so in that email, you're going to be getting uh, a link to download your uh, certificate. You're going to be getting a link. Uh, you won't get a link for presentation download, but there is a presentation download in another link on the email. You'll see it. It'll be very clear when you see it. Um, Harry Waters, one of our speakers, has very kindly um, donated uh, a sustainable English course book. So that's going to be free to download. Once you open the email, you'll see it very clear clearly linked on that email. So take a look out for that, keep your eyes out. And also if you happen to, if you need to leave halfway through or you wanna watch it again, or if you want to watch one of the later sessions because we're doing this three times today, this is the first of three times we're doing this today. Uh, if you want to watch any of the other recordings because the discussions will vary from, uh, from, from each time to time, uh, you can go to macmillanenglish.com slash webinar archive or scan the QR code that you can see on your screen now and it'll take you straight there. 
We've got loads already, already there if you want to see them. Um, the next thing I wanted to ask you about is if you are active on social media, you may well have heard of this session on social media, so you might be following us anyway, but please do follow us. We've got uh, our LinkedIn page there, you've got the Twitter page, and you've got the Facebook page. Uh, so scan the QR code and you'll go straight to those pages. Follow us, keep up to date with everything that we're doing. Also, if you want to shout about what you've seen today, if you want to perhaps share your opinion on some of the things that you hear about today, it would be really great uh, if you could uh, put a hashtag, hashtag teach English and hashtag advancing learning um, so that uh, you can get a bit of a chat going with the rest of the community as well. Um, so today is, it is not only the first roundtable discussion today that we're having, and it's not only the first time that we're introducing some of the speakers that you're going to see today. This is the very first webinar of season four of Advancing Learning Academic Programme. I'm extremely excited. Um, it's something that I, uh, it's, it's my entire world, the Advancing Learning Academic Programme, and I absolutely love uh, to deliver it and look after it, and hopefully by proxy looking after everybody else in the community who, who attends some of our webinars or reads our blog, um, or who listens to our podcasts, who listens to our blogcasts as well. Um, we've got, a whole host of things lined up for you over the next sort of nine months between now and May. We've got loads of things coming. So we've got in the next few weeks, I'll tell you in a sec, we've got some webinars coming up before, before the end of the year. We've also got a winter fair coming in uh, December. Uh, that's around mid-December. You'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. Uh, and then moving into next year, we've got a whole host of uh, webinars and podcast sessions, uh, blogcast blogs coming as well. Um, not to mention you heard it here first, the Global Teachers Festival is coming back. So keep an eye out for that. Um, if you want to take a look at what we did in season three and in season two and in season one, uh, you can go to the website just on the screen there that you can see. So macmillanenglish.com slash advancing dash learning dash academic dash program slash home, or you can scan the QR code, which hopefully makes it a bit easier for you, or just go to Macmillan English and you'll see it quite easily as well. So that's the season four, it's kicking off today. This is the first session of season four. And we are, so you can see our five areas we're covering, students' global skills, student uh, advancing inclusivity, advancing assessment for the future, advancing digital teaching skills, advancing teaching skills, and the new one this year is advancing well-being. Um, we have so far done quite a lot of work on uh, well-being in our academic program, and we will continue to be doing that. So do keep a lookout for the Advanced Learning Academic Program and uh, sign up. So as I said, I wanted to let you know about the webinars coming up. So in a week's time, we've got a session from Lorena Pembert on uh, phonics in the pre-primary classroom. And then a few weeks after that, we've got Lucy Crichton uh, talking about reception to production to um, confident communication. Um, so talking sort of about scaffolding, but sort of a, a closer look at language, linguistics within the scaffolded classroom, within the scaffolded uh, approach to teaching. Uh, if you want to register for those, again, you've got a QR code, just scan that or type in the extremely long URL that you can see on the screen there. Um, OK, so over to today, we're going to start talking about today. I'm going to bring everyone into the room any second. Um, so I won't introduce the speakers. I will say who they are, but I won't talk about them. That's 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 going to happen when the session starts. So I would like to please welcome into the room uh, Zarina Saban, Jessica Gidamu, Harry Waters, Matt Hayes, and Mariella Gill, if you're there. Hello, let's just double check microphones again, guys. Good, good. Hello. Hello, hello, good. Hello. 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 Test, test. Good stuff, good stuff. Hello. Matt's there, Mariella's there, lovely stuff. Great, lovely to see you guys. How are you all? Good, thank you. Very Any good. Stuff? Great, Pretty thank good. you. Excited good. to be here. Me too, extremely excited. This is the first of its kind, and you guys are you guys are helming a new era of advancing learning. I hope you realise that. That's a quite a responsibility you've got on your shoulders. I feel like a trailblazer. It's <laughs> exactly what you are, Harry. <laughs> I wonder if I need to leave the webinar and come back in, Will, because my camera's not responding now. Oh, that's fine, Mary. Yeah, do that, please. I will please try do. that. Okay. No probs. Okay, so we've got quite a lot, quite a lot uh, planned for today's session. I'll tell you what, I'm going to unshare my screen, I think. share so you can see everybody's wonderful faces there we go that's better 
so while we wait for Mario to get in, um, do you want to just quickly say five seconds about yourselves, starting with Jessica? Sorry, to say five seconds about myself? Yeah. Um, so yeah, sure. I'm 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 Jessica. Uh, I'm the Global Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Spring and Nature. And Macmillan Education is the education arm of Spring and Nature. Great. Who's next? I won't choose. I'm going to wait. Okay. Oh, <laughs> sure. Serena, please. After you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Um, I'm uh, an ELT teacher originally, um, been in ELT for over 30 years now, but started off in the sciences uh, and um, moved into teacher training and teacher education. I'm Harry, as you can probably see. Uh, I've been a teacher, well, involved in ELT and a teacher, teacher trainer, content creator for about 15 years now. But you don't look old enough. Yes, I know. Thank you. Um, Harry, you don't look old enough. Oh, well, thanks so much. Um, it's because I've got my hat on, you see. Um, but I have uh, the last kind of five or six years been really dedicated towards um, the environment and sustainability within ELT. And the last year or so, I've been working on uh, this, this here, Renewable English, also here and there and there. I um, am here, but I cannot get my video to work now, Will. I don't know if this has happened before. This has not happened before. We've got a strange camera with a cross through it. Yeah, and I haven't done a thing to make that happen. So, Mariana, I'll tell you what, if, you, um, if we just get started and then I will send you a different link. So once, once the conversation gets going, I'll send you a different link. Okay, uh, let's do that. Yeah. All right. And finally, uh, Mr. Matt Hayes. Hi everyone, I'm Matt. Uh, I'm a PhD researcher in global citizenship education and also a proud uh, former Mac Edda as well. So I worked from in education for many years and great to be here. Great, lovely to see you, Matt. Well, welcome everyone. I think that's, I've gone way, I've gone way over my lot of time here. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna uh, leave it to Mariella. Mariella is your host for today. Uh, she's also sort of a host slash panelist. So. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye. Have a wonderful session, guys, and I'll I'll see, see you later. All right. Thanks, Will. Um, I'm sorry. I apologize, everybody, that you can't see me, but I'm here. I am Mariela Gill, publisher for the American English Primary and Pre-Primary uh, and Global Methodologies uh, portfolio at Macmillan Education, and I'm very excited to be moderating this panel on education for sustainable development and citizenship. We have one hour together, and my goal is for us to all learn a little bit about education for sustainable development and citizenship, how to integrate it into the classroom, and what publishers can do to support that. Um, I will also make sure that we make time for your questions to get all of your questions answered. I see you're a very active group. I can see you're all working the chat, which is great. We will weave your questions in as we go if, um, if I happen to spot them, but we'll, we'll very dutifully be taking notes. So we'll leave la uh, 15 minutes at the end to make sure that uh, we get to those questions. So please send your questions as we go and we'll be, we'll, we'll, we'll be taking notes. Um, so we've already heard uh, who our panelists are and um, I'd like you to help me welcome them very warmly. And we're going to get started with uh, the, the following question. Why is each one of their areas of interest uh, important or relevant to ELT and ELT professionals? We're going to keep this a round of light at two minutes each. And I would like to start with Zarina. Why is diversity, equity, and inclusion relevant to ELT? Well, I, I would say in terms of ELT teaching in the classroom, um, inclusion is important because you want everybody on board. It makes the teacher's job easier. Um, when you've got people who are motivated and engaged, you're going to have them on board. Um, but when you're talking about topics that don't really seem relevant to your students, then you have a problem. Um, one issue is sometimes if students can't relate to the materials that they're covering. If they see people like themselves in the materials, they see names that are like their own names in the materials, uh, they're going to get engaged. Um, I was brought up in the UK 
Um, and throughout my education, I don't ever remember seeing a Zarina in a book, in a storybook or, or in any type of book. Um, and recently I came upon a, a little children's tale um, uh, written by a South African writer and uh, there was Zarina and I felt like this kind of excitement and thrill. And uh, if that happens to me as an adult, you can imagine how you can be engaging our students if you can involve them and include them um, and have all kind of diverse uh, people on, on the pages of, of textbooks. Absolutely. I've actually realized that as well, looking at books with my daughter, my daughter's name is Uma and um, Disney has a movie and it, it just lights, she, her lies, her eyes light up when Uma comes on screen. So absolutely. Um, uh, can we move on to Harry? Harry, can you tell us a little bit about why sustainability and a focus on the kinds of things you do on your website is relevant in ELT? Absolutely. I think um, it's not just relevant to ELT, to be honest. I think with the environment, with the planet, the, the way it is, I think it's relevant to absolutely everything. Um, you know, I think it should be included in all areas of curriculum. It should be involved in maths, in science, in, in English lessons, you know, in, in whatever possible, the environment should be connected to it. It is, you know, a climate crisis that we're facing. There is urgent action required now. Um, so I think wherever possible, we need to be able to educate not only young people, but also adults and you know change makers plus future change makers so within ELT the global reach that we have you know the fact it is yeah. probably the only subject mm -hmm. that reaches all four corners of the globe um, I think it's of utmost importance to us to get it into our classes and into our students heads absolutely thank you and you actually said that all in less than two minutes Harry <laughs> that's, that's very rare for me <laughs> oh goodness okay so um thank you everybody i noticed all of the suggestions for um how i can get my camera i tried f10 that's not working i am going to um ask matt the same question and then i am going to go ahead and restart my computer so will might have to come in to to um you know help while i do that Matt, please tell us about global citizenship and why it's relevant in ELT. And I'm going to Absolutely. leave for a second and leave you with that. Thanks, Is that Mary. okay, Will? Please do, Mariella. Yeah, go there ahead. Okay. okay, all right, thanks, Matt. Um, well, so Harry's answer was great, really. That, that um, addresses global citizenship education as well, really, because a lot of the... Um, one of the big global issues that global citizenship education tries to prepare learners to tackle is, of course, the climate crisis. And so one of the, uh, the answers to, to why it's of interest and relevance to ELT professionals and the broader ELT sector is because it's just relevant to all of us. These are global issues that we all face. Um, but the other the two ways I think are helpful to think about it. One is the idea of it as an opportunity for teachers. Um, and the other is uh, uh, as, an op as a responsibility. So in terms of an opportunity, you can see that through English, the intention is to engage uh, individuals with the wider world and to be able to communicate uh, often to non-native speakers in English as well for work or for travel or for uh, general societal um, engagement. And global citizenship education gives a great framework to do that with. Uh, in terms of engaging with the wider world. So it's a great opportunity in that respect. It's also a responsibility because in teaching English to your students, you are presenting them in many cases with a certain worldview that comes from those, those dominant countries behind the English language, um, a largely Western worldview. And one of the key elements of global citizenship education is to engage critically with those dominant worldviews and to, to bring in broader perspectives and to look at what is social justice uh, at a global level as well and, and the ways in which uh, the West dominate the world unfairly. So I, I think also it's good to see it as a responsibility for teachers as well. Thanks, Matt. Again, I think bang on two minutes. Thanks very much for that. 
Um, over to you, Jessica. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so I think similarly, uh, as, as what I just said, um, I, I think I have a similar approach of like, I think it's important. DEI is important to everyone. And I can tell you why it's important to us. And, and I think that's also why I feel it's important to ELT and ELT professionals. Um, and so for us at DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion is one of our core strategic priorities because we believe that it is vital um, to address any problem that can stand in the way of great research or great education. And diversity, equity, and inclusion are essential to kind of achieving our mission, our company's mission, of opening doors to discovery and to enable researchers and educators and um, clinicians and, and other professionals to access and trust and, and just make sense of the latest um, insights so that we can together improve and enrich lives and, and actually help to protect our planet for future generations. Um, and it is also quite simply the right thing to do because it makes us better and it puts us in the best position uh, to support um, the research and education communities that we work with every day. And, and the same thing, having said that, um, we also recognize that um, systemic barriers to equality and to equity exist. And, and we want to act purposefully to eliminate um, any barriers to creating and discovering and using knowledge. Um, and so, and I think that is why it is also important um, to anyone, frankly, and, and to educators, I guess, in particular, because they provide um, the skills to the people who will become our next scientists and educators and leaders and just the, the next generation. And we want to make sure that these are as diverse as possible, that they have equitable access and that they feel included. And that's why I believe it's important. Thanks, Jessica. I'll leave it over to you, Mariana. Great to see you. Great. I've never <laughs> been so happy to join a webinar. <laughs> my camera on. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so um, I'm going to dive right in with a hard question. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Matt this question. So Matt, here we are sitting in the global north, you specifically in the UK, working with a publisher uh, like Macmillan. Who are you and who are we to tell teachers around the world what they should be doing in their classrooms? That's a fantastic question. And um, well, for global citizenship education, it cuts to the core of, of what it's all about, really. Uh, and if you're asking that question, then you're on the right track. So one of the challenges with global citizenship education is that there is no universal definition. And in fact, um, there's many different interpretations of it, uh, some of which, to go a little bit back to my earlier comment, are very much rooted in Western perspectives. So you might come across uh, perspectives of global citizenship education, for example, that are about um, skills for the economy and this idea that basically we're just producing a generation of global workers um, at, without this idea of global justice and taking action on, on big issues like the climate crisis. Um, so I suppose the reason why um, it's so important to engage with, with global citizenship education is so that you can be a voice in that debate and to make sure that those um, interpretations are challenged and that the perspectives of your particular uh, part of the world and your, your worldview are taken into account. Um, the, the, I think the most interesting facet of global citizenship education is the idea that we're really trying to cultivate a critical uh, thought process in students for when they become uh, adults so that they will critically engage with the world and not just be charitable and be uh, altruistic and get on with everyone but also really question where the injustices are and take action against them and that that's precisely why it's right to question where this comes from and to make your own contribution to that debate. That's really interesting Matt um, the critical aspect to it um, I'm wondering, uh, Harry, if you feel that that, that uh, critical stance is something that um, 
you see in, in when you're building your lessons plans, when you're when you're thinking about um, sustainability in ELT, um, is that something you bring out the the critical lens? Is that something that naturally fits in with that topic? One hundred percent. I mean, a lot of things that that Matt says really do mirror um, the way I feel in particular about sustainability within ELT, and you know, who are we to tell people what to do? I mean, a lot of what. I like to do is try and learn from other people as well to try and learn from other cultures to try and learn different ways of, of going about things because as we know the global north does have the largest carbon footprint you know it is what we are doing here in the north is causing more damage to other people you know and what we need to do is take a step back and learn from these other behaviors learn from these other ways of living you know not simply impose you know, our ideals, our ways of living, you know, it's, it's no use us saying, hey, you know what, guys, what you really need to do is go out and recycle and buy a bamboo toothbrush to an indigenous group in Peru, because, you know, what are they, well, thanks, you know, th that's completely irrelevant. And I think, you know, for me, one of the big things is, is, is starting with these, these kind of smaller individual actions, because, Something I've found um, in my time as a teacher, you can't just go in and say, what you're doing is bad, you need to do it differently. You need to grow like this love for nature. You need to grow a love for the planet before you can even start saying, you know, now we need to, to make a difference. Um, so it is quite a long process and like planting those seeds of environmentalism, you know, very early on are really important to then get to that stage that Matt was talking about of, of people questioning and, and students finding their voice. You know, something I really like to, to get into with a lot of my students who are, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, they're getting their first kind of bank accounts, you know, to say to them, ask your parents, you know, to look for a bank that, that doesn't invest in fossil fuels, you know, and get these ideas in there nice and early so they can make their, their decisions. And I think yes. it's not about us telling them, but helping mm. them come to these ideas and, and, you know, suggesting and helping them draw their own conclusions. Thanks, Harry. And I'm wondering if picking up on something you've just said and something that Serena said earlier about seeing yourself represented and seeing that you are a valid part of the conversation, I wonder, Zarina, how um, how do we ensure that uh, that students of all ages, because I think even as Harry said, a twelve year old, but also even a six or a five year old, how do we ensure that they feel empowered, um, you know, uh, to be a relevant part of the conversation? Do do you have thoughts, wh whether it's about diversity or uh, or sustainability, on how to bring that? open that up to them yeah um i i think it's it's about representation as well um so yes sustainability is, is important and and so is is the environment but all aspects of life um that affect you uh, and that are important to you um and you could look at uh for example um um global warming from different perspectives. Um, for, for example, that there was a report that said, if girls and women are involved in local decisions, then it makes a, a huge outcome on, in terms of resource management and conservation outcomes. So if you've got, if you've got um, examples in your classes that are ignoring interests that the different groups of students in your classes have, you're excluding their voice in a way. Um, and I think because we're all in the ELT world as well, we've got to accept that English has become such an important lingua franca in the world that um, it's a language through which decisions are made and, and um, important news and information is, is sent out through this medium that we're, we're actually enabling our students to be part of this world globally, um, but also we can make them aware of what's going on locally as well. So there's the, the relationship that they can see um, to their immediate surroundings and what's going on in the outside world. Um, 
I, I was teaching for, for three years in Nepal in very rural communities um, where you don't have running water, electricity, those just, just aren't part of life. Um, and schools there, they, they had bathrooms and toilets for girls and boys, but water wasn't always available. Um, and, you know, practicalities of, of the life of a young girl through puberty, becoming a woman, she needs water um, to, to clean up. And, and so that type of decision was excluding girls from education. It's not what you might think that you have to think about to make sure everybody is included. Um, in Thailand, um, it's been great to see how you can have access to bathrooms for different genders. And it's not just a, 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 a his or her bathroom scenario. Um, so if you don't feel that you belong or associate to a gender, how does it feel walking into a bathroom that you don't feel you belong to? Um, those kind of things are, are at the essence of who you are. Um, and I think English can give you a voice to express all of that, which you may not feel comfortable doing um, and doing it in maybe a role play in a, a foreign language allows you to, to bring out elements that you may not feel actually willing to discuss otherwise. Um, and that can bring in all kinds of aspects from the environment to gender, to representation, to, to rights. Um, and you can have a really rich, um, uh, environment to, to be learning English through. As well, Serena's connection to a, a global community, uh, a virtual global community, right? Yeah. Um, so I'd like to move the conversation a little bit uh, to address something that is kind of in the air as we speak about all of these things, which is the question of privilege, right? Because with all of the various circumstances that we live in, we have every one of us different degrees of privilege in our lives. And so the question I want to open up to the panel is should the level of privilege that we enjoy, each individual, should that equate, and, and businesses and countries, should that equate to the level of responsibility to address issues of global concern, issues of inequality, of exclusion? Who would like to take this question? to get us started with it. I could uh, get us started if, if that helps, because um, it is a really great question. Um, so with global citizenship education, um, it does build on lots of um, pedagogies and frameworks that will be familiar to, to everyone from 21st century skills to global education, uh, to sustainable education and more. Um, but the real differentiator is this idea of citizenship and that with citizenship that carries both rights and responsibilities. And this is so one sort of angle to take on um, whether more privilege equals more responsibility is the danger there is you then replicate the very injustice that you're trying to um, address. Um, and so the the idea with um, with global citizenship education should be to uh, encourage everyone to feel like they have an equal opportunity to engage with the issues of the world and some of the dangers of equating privilege with responsibility is that you end up with basically a global elite <clears throat> that attend international private schools and can fly all over the world and that you know uh, maybe they live um, in another country and they go back to their, their home country and so they're very comfortable with all these different cultures and global citizenship works for them in that respect. Uh, and then they think of it in terms of charitable giving and uh, the idea of um, sort of imposition on the other. Whereas I think if you, um, if you try to look at responsibility as shared equally, um, then you avoid that, uh, that idea that global citizenship just becomes for an elite and it's just about uh, being exposed to different cultures through travel or wealth. Whereas actually it's just a, as much about your local, hyper-local issues and about uh, inclusivity and about uh, you know, some of the things that Zarina was talking about as well. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, it's also simply a, a I, 
in a less academic way, I guess global citizenship is as well, simply a way of life, of feeling a part of a community where you're responsible for every day for what you do, thinking not just the impact on your friends and family, but on an environment that is interconnected, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Yes, yeah, I, I, I find Matt's perspective really interesting, I, uh, this idea of, of equal responsibility and, and looking at this from uh, a DEI perspective, I think we often think of, we talk about privilege, I think there is an understanding that with privilege also comes more responsibility in how we, um, yeah, how we help or how we support um, uh, structures that will allow others to participate who might not have um, that privilege. And, and we speak uh, a lot about allyship in that context. Like internally, we think a lot about allyship and, and how, can we, how can we be better allies to other people in an area where we have privilege, um, for example. Um, so uh, we, we have a number of internal uh, employee networks um, that bring together different communities. So um, for example, we have a women's network, we have a disability and neurodiversity network, a black employee network. Um, and our women's network recently published a, a guide to um, to be a male ally and 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 kind of give um, people ideas of how how can they be allies and share their privilege in elevating voices of others. And 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 I, and I really I, I do think that there is this level of shared responsibility and I agree with Matt, but I, I do also think that there are areas where in a situation when we have privilege, um, we we do have a responsibility to kind of elevate others um, and, and help level the playing field, be that in terms of creating representation or um, yeah, just like like very simply, like in a meeting, who speaks in a meeting? How can I make sure that different voices are heard, that different people get to participate? Um, we we have a similar guide for for uh, that was created by our LGBT plus network that looks at how can we be allies to the LGBT plus community? How can we create spaces where people feel included? So I I I, I like to look at it with this with this balance of shared responsibility, but also but also individual responsibility mm -hmm. for leveling the playing field. Um, and I, I'd like to ask something, maybe that this might seem like a silly question, but I just need to ask it. How do you recognize your own privilege? Like, how does each person look inside mm -hmm. and recognize where is it that that I have advantages that maybe others don't? Yes, Serena, you want to if take I can that? jump in there? Yeah, I, I think uh, one good way of, of thinking about it is when you walk into a room, how many people look like you? Mm. How many people represent you? in that room as well, um, their interests, their ideas. Um, so if a lot of people are looking like you in the room, then you're probably sharing a privilege um, because they're in the majority there. Um, if not many people look like you, then you probably have less of that privilege. Um, and I think talking of, of privilege and power as well, I think um, English language offers you that as well. Um, we're all in the ELT business and um, some people, you know, think of, of the English language as, is it a colonial empire in a different form? Um, and, but uh, you could also look at it as a, as a great tool. Just last week, um, the novelist Abdul Razak Gurna won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He's a Tanzanian writer. So you can see that English has provided him power and privilege and a voice to to actually um, represent his world and his ideas to the world um, and so I think although we may be dealing with with parts of the world and, and students who don't have privilege who don't have power and we're dealing with communities and societies who are relatively um, powerless and in, in com comparison to to uh, uh, the northern world, the developed world, um, you could see it as a way of gaining privilege. Uh, and I've experienced that as, a, as an English language teacher coming from an Indian background, Indian parentage, 
being born in Britain, it allowed me a certain privilege and power uh, to to actually be able to to go out in the world and become a, an ELT uh, teacher educator, uh, which probably would I would not have had the same privilege without that English language power. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go go ahead, Mary. Well, I was going to pick up on something that Jessica said and something that you just said. So Jessica said, bring the, introduce the concept of allyship. And you've just introduced the concept of, of English as an empowering tool of bringing, of bringing, of increasing the, your, your privilege and your power. And I'm just thinking as a teacher, when you walk into your classroom, and, and Serena, you said, you walk into a room, how many people look like you? I'm thinking as a teacher, you're probably doing that from two perspectives, right? Mm -hmm. You're thinking, how, how do I situate myself within this classroom with these, you know, 10, 15, 30, however many, 50 um, students, but also looking at it from the point of view of every single one of those students, right? And what are things that teachers can do when they see that that they need to extend allyship to their students because the teacher-student relationship is one of, of unequal power typically, right? Where the teacher holds most of the power in the classroom. I'd like to open that up a little bit, see if, what um, do you think? Yeah, if I can jump on that one there. I think for me, one of the big moments in my life for like recognizing my own privilege, obviously as a, as a straight white man, I am aware of the privilege that I have. And, you know, it's, you know, it's as plain as can be, but I was working at a private school here in Spain and the, it's, it was a very, very right wing school, which went very much against my ideals, but, you know, mortgage and food and stuff like that had to be paid. So it was a job that I could get. And I remember one of the students was talking a lot and complaining a lot about immigrants in Spain, like a lot. And I, I just said, look, I'm, I'm an immigrant. And the first thing he said was, yes, but you're different. And that was the moment, that was the like the, the penny dropping moment of like privilege in there. It's like, yes, but you're different. It's like, I know why you're saying that I'm different, but I'm not, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I've come here, I've taken somebody's job uh, to come in here and, and like work in a school. So for me, that was like a huge moment of, of seeing that. And, and, you know, going back to the, to the, the earlier, the question of the, with more privilege, should we have more responsibility? I think one of the big issues looking at COP26, for example, is the, the countries of privilege, the countries you know, that are um, out there causing the most damage. They have more responsibility to change their own actions. You know, there is more responsibility within themselves to stop fracking, to stop going out and, and digging new coal mines and so on and so forth. It is not our responsibility to tell other countries what they should be doing. Um, I think in that respect, you know, the, the more privileged countries should be taking responsibility for their own actions, but not have the responsibility to tell others what to do. I think maybe learning from other countries is, is what you know, the global north should be doing. And I think the the lack of representation that there's going to be at COP26 is one of the big issues that, that I have with it, certainly. Um, and well, it's one of the issues that, that there is with it. So I won't go on for too long because as I know, we don't have long left. And I don't want to get on a rant because I quite easily <laughs> could right now. <laughs> well, before I, before I bring in another question, I'd, I'd like to open it up to the panel. Would anybody like to uh, say anything else specifically about privilege and allyship and bringing that into the classroom. Yes, Serena. Sorry, uh, just to, to connect with what you said about how to maybe get students to feel um, represented. Um, a really nice way I've used with students is doing a questionnaire at the start of an academic year uh, to find out what their interests are, what, what their particular um, niche um, likes and dislikes are um, and then to try and use that information throughout the year in in the worksheets that you produce in, in the, the kind of video clips or audios that you select um, to to add to your to your various classes or particular projects um, to be able to hand over that power and privilege to the student and that's 
really what we're talking about when we, we talk about making classes student-centered. It's handing over the power to the students to be able to do what they want with the language that they've been practicing. Um, and, and from a pedagogical point of view, it's really powerful because they get more engaged. They use the language, um, they're practicing. It's more student-student interaction rather than teacher-student conversation. But at the same time, they start feeling somewhat empowered um, by having a voice and by being able to do uh, what they want with interest areas that they want that reflect their personalities. Um, and, and that's part of uh, power as well, to feel enough confidence to be able to reflect your inner self, um, which a lot of people feel they can't do. Zarina, you made me think of something that I'd like to raise, which is that there might be topics that some teachers there might be, say, say that you re realize either in conversations with individual students or in the questionnaire you do at the beginning of the year, that there are certain aspects of a student's identity or, or interests that you'd like to bring in. But for, in certain contexts, teachers might feel a little bit afraid to do that because they might feel like, well, I might be either exposing the student because maybe they're in the minority and they will feel worse if I bring it up? Or what if I bring it, what, what if I integrate, bring that kind of topic in or that identity or open up uh, topics that most of the class isn't comfortable with? What if I don't know how to handle that situation in the moment? What if it gets political? What if it gets difficult? What are, what is, what does the panel think? Are there tips that we can give teachers to also empower teachers to handle situations that they might be a little bit um, scared of? If I can jump in, sure. um, I, I would say that uh, by not holding the power of the topic themselves, if the teacher is the one who is disseminating information about a topic it's their perspective only as well um, and if it is slightly political uh, topic then yes you want to be careful of, of that as a teacher obviously um, but uh, that's another reason to hand it over so if there's a topic for, for example just taking uh, the environment and climate change just a couple of years ago, I think a lot of teachers might have been afraid that it was a bit political. However, it's now such a hot topic of, of interest and um, of necessity, I think, that it's, it's lost that politicization, if you will. And I think that can happen with many topics over time. If there is enough awareness um, and it's portrayed um, not in an emotional sense, but as a necessity. Um, and so one, one activity I, I've done is I've actually um, tied uh, an arm to someone with tissue paper, with toilet roll, uh, so it's not very, you know, it's not too tight or, or painful or anything. I've, I've tied people's legs together. Um, I've put fingers so you can't really use your hands. Um, I've put a patch over someone's eye. I've put things over people's ears so that they sense how it is to lose a sense and to not be fully able just to put themselves from in the perspective of what might it feel like if you are not able-bodied. And that can be a nice starting point without preaching or, or telling people what to think. The thoughts come from the students themselves. And I think that's an important element. That's really interesting. So putting people in, in a, a completely different context so that they they start questioning themselves, bringing in that critical stance that Harry and Matt uh, uh, brought up earlier. I'm just looking at the time and I realize that soon we're going to open up to the Q&A. So I want to remind the audience 
We have a few minutes later for you to bring your questions in. So please start thinking about them, put them in the chat so that Will is all set with uh, questions for the Q&A. Um, and I would actually like to, I had two questions left. So I'll, um, I'll actually ask very briefly one of them and then we'll get to our final question. So this is, um, ELT has, ELT I think is a really interesting field, very dynamic, where we have the opportunity to bring in um, all kinds of, uh, of thoughts that aren't just about language, vocabulary, and grammar, right? So in the context of uh, sustainability, of global citizenship, and of diversity, equity, and inclusion, what are some of the changes that the panelists would like to see in the future of ELT? What would you like to see happen in the next few years? Well, um, if, I, if, you, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in there. I think one of the big things is um, sustainability and the environment becoming involved throughout you know, textbooks, throughout units, you know, not just having that single unit with all the terrible things that are happening in the world or that single unit that says, hey guys, it's really good to recycle. And then people go and recycle and they're like, yay, I'm doing my bit for the planet. Well, it's not really enough. Um, you know, it's, it is a bit and it's a great start. Don't get me wrong, recycling is a wonderful start, but to be doing that and say you love the planet is a bit like saying you're on a diet just by having a Diet Coke with your Big Mac. You know, it's, it's not exactly enough. Um, so I think taking it, bringing it forward into the fore of every unit in a textbook. You know, when you're talking about fashion, don't just talk about jeans. Don't just talk about that. Talk about you know, the amount of water it takes to, to make a pair of jeans. You know, just talk about secondhand fashion. You know, glorify an upcycling designer rather than glorifying, I don't know, Yves Saint Laurent. That was literally the first one that came into my head. I don't know why. Very 90s of me. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I think just bringing it to the fore. And again, I don't think it's a bad thing to, to bring the politics of these things into classes. I think when it comes to the environment, we need to encourage activism within our students. We need to encourage our students to find their voice um, and to speak out about the, these issues. So that's one thing for me that's as a big thing in my classes really is the encouragement to question, you know, to stand up and say, is that really okay? I know teachers don't really like it when students have that power, but I think giving them that power and again, empowering our students to come out. And again, parents don't really like it when you encourage your students that, you know, Fridays for the future and, and climate strikes on Fridays. Parents aren't huge fans of that, but I think that power to your students, particularly your older teens, is really important. And if they are passionate about it, I think you know, aiding that and helping that as much as possible is kind of our place as, as ELT, as, as educators and, you know, facilitators. Thanks, Harry. Would anybody else like to speak to that before I ask you the final question I have for you? Yes, Serena. Um, I, would, I would love to see more representation in ELT materials. Um, because at the end of the day, who you see in, in books and how people are portrayed um, has an effect on your own mindset, on where you belong in the world and um, how you see yourself and how you think of yourself. Um, and in education, when we're dealing with young people, we want to give them as many diverse, positive representations as possible. Um, so for ELT material, right, so I would, say, you know, really think about how are you portraying a, a person of color, a person of disability? Are they just, is it tokenism that they're just there on the page? How exactly are they being represented should be a, a bigger thought um, process, I think, yeah. Thanks, Serena. Matt, looks like you want to add something as well. Uh, yeah, I, well, I echo everything that uh, Zarina and Harry said. Um, and it was on my list actually. So the, the, the only other thing would be around, I think when I've been looking at, um, at ELT textbooks and global citizenship education, my biggest worry is that students or teenagers in particular feel a lack of agency and they just feel daunted by the scale of the global challenges that we face. And I think particularly in the context of the pandemic where 
a lot of kids have had a really tough two years and you look at sort of depression levels, et cetera, I think there could be a role there for uh, the ELT community and, and publishers to help give, um, give those students scaffolded approach to the actions they could take so they can see that they really can make a, a change and that feeling of empowerment will hopefully uh, address that lack of agency and that, that slightly bleak view of the future. And then um, I think there's also things you could do there to connect students across different cultures because ELT publishers have that great connection across you know, kids learning the same materials all over the world. And I think that would also help everyone feel that they're not alone and that there is a bigger global community that is trying to tackle these, these big problems. Thanks, Matt. I think those are all great ideas. Yes, Jessica? Yeah, I, 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 I so much agree. And uh, what Serena said, earlier on, on on representation is something that I like that that I felt really so much in my heart um uh, because I when I grew up like all the all the books that we read as as kids they were only white kids and white children and and white adults and and I never really felt that I can see myself um uh, in in one of these books and and I think one thing that I would like to add without being an uh, uh, well um a too deep in ELT myself but one thing that I would like to add is is the power of empathy and of putting ourselves in other people's shoes and teaching um, children teaching people um, to to change perspective and I think that has so much to do with um, creating the capacity to to drive inclusion in people and and understanding that our um, perspective is not the only one um, that our our view of the world is is not the only one and empathizing with with others and with other people's uh, situations of life i think that is something that kind of adds i would like to add to the to, to, to the aspect of representation absolutely and um i think empathy is relevant for all age groups even adults who are, are maybe sometimes we're more set in our ways you know absolutely so before we open up to will i would like to ask each one of you if your audience is left with one single takeaway, what would you like it to be? We can do a lightning round. Who would like to go first? One single takeaway. I can, I can, uh, so because it connects a little bit to what we discussed earlier. So coming back to the question of privilege, I think one thing that I find very, um, that I found really interesting is that privilege is invisible to those who have it and that we're often not aware of our privilege and at the same time each and every one of us we can do something to make other people feel more included and to really spend some time to think about like what is the one thing that I can do to make a, a student another person feel more included um, with kind of sharing what I have I think that that's a, that's a takeaway. Thanks Jessica. Who would like to go next? Zarina, please. I'd like to add, because it follows on nicely from what Jessica just said there, um, is to deal with biases that we have um, and um, help students overcome those biases of the world. Um, you know, if you, if you call someone an activist, what's that bias that immediately comes into your head about being an activist? If, if you refer to someone who's who's black or, or bisexual does that create another bias um so uh just like to quote from uh verne myers who said biases are the stories we make up about people before we know who they are so i think through education we can help our students understand how people are and see things from different perspectives and therefore have that empathy and understanding and tolerance um, and that I think leads to to good citizenship whether it's local or global. You gave me goosebumps Serena. <laughs> Matt, Harry? Matt? Um, uh, yeah so I, I, I thought uh, Serena and Jessica's takeaways are fantastic. Um, for, for me it's probably around um, not thinking that global citizenship education is a framework for action specifically and that it somehow prescribes the actions that individuals should take 
but more that it's a way of encouraging your students to engage critically with the world around them in all of those different contexts that we've discussed. And it's really for them to decide the actions that they would like to take as individuals. Um, that would be my one takeaway. Wonderful. I love the critical stance. Harry. I think again, echoing what the, the everybody said beforehand. Um, and yeah, the, the critical thinking side of things to, to take away into your classes. You don't need to be given a whole bunch of sustainability materials. You don't need to be an expert about the environment and the planet. What you need is to care and help your students care and just get them to think about it. You know, if the unit in your book is about transport, you don't have to have loads of facts and stats and numbers, but you can get them to stop and think, hmm, if I drive to school every day and it's a 15 minute walk, what other ways could I do it, which would maybe make, you know, have less harm on the planet. So that kind of thing, to getting them to think about it um, and yeah, draw their own conclusions from the existing materials. But obviously, if people need other materials, there are plenty out there. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Harry. And with that, <laughs> I ask Will to join us again. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Back to you, Will. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for agreeing to take part in this discussion. It was absolutely wonderful. We've had lots of, um, lots of really interesting comments, lots of love as well in the chat, lots and lots of love in the chat box So um, to, to all of you. So thank you very much for being, for being part of this discussion. Thank you. Uh, so we've had we have had uh, a lot of questions um and i was going through them i was trying to i was bolding i was bolding the ones that i wanted to ask and i've actually bolded all of them um, so i'm gonna have to try and cut it down somehow um so the first question we've got is okay so we spoke you've spoken quite a lot actually in this chat about um about helping them uh, feel responsibility towards their community and make sure that they feel part of it within themselves and uh, as, as a part of that, that wider community. Um, but how exactly can you do that in the class? I mean, be as specific or non-specific as you like, but how is that actually, how can you foster that in a student in, in, in the classroom? That's put to everybody or anybody. Um, for me, um, fostering a love for nature, the first step is super simple, is that like literally the easiest thing anyone can do. I don't know if you can see behind me, I've got two wonderful plants just growing there. Both of those are class plants that start, well, actually they started as one class plant where, you know, we grew it, we turned it into a project, we then propagated it and it's now two plants, as you can see, that are kind of intertwined, they're, they're almost holding hands there behind me. Um, and that can be done, that can be done, you know, face to face, that can be done online. And it's those very simple early steps um, to help empower our students and get them to have that love for the planet. Um, for me, that's very, very basic. Um, and yeah, instead of having a class toy or a class pet, why not have a class plant? Cheers, Harry. Does anyone else want to answer that as well from a different perspective, perhaps? Um, if I can jump in, following on from, from Harry's plant there, um, things that you do inside and outside the classroom, uh, whether it is dealing with plants, or you could get students to go out and take a photograph of something that, that uh, annoys you. And it can be from whatever perspective. So you could tackle noise pollution, you could tackle traffic, you could tackle rubbish on the streets, you could tackle um, all kinds of issues from whatever perspective they want. Um, and they then bring those things into the classroom and, and want to talk about it because they've got, they feel empowered about that particular topic that they've chosen. Um, it's student centered, it's local, it's from their surroundings. Um, and you can then come up with solutions, you can have discussions. <clears throat> so just, just like um, Harry's plants are intertwined, you intertwine so many skills through those kind of activities. Um, and at the same time, they're learning about responsibility towards their local um, environment and as a citizen in that community as well. Wonderful, thanks, Serena. Jessica, Mariella, Matt, do you have anything you wanted to add there? 
I would like to add the idea of always wondering what, whatever you have in front of you on, on your screen, in your books, uh, if you bring something in from the environment uh, for your lesson, opening it up to students to always wonder whose perspective are we looking at? To me, that's the, that's the basis of critical literacy. That's the basis of the critical stance and global skills within global citizenship education and the stepping stone to creating an environment where what has, as Serena was saying earlier, students are empowered, right? So by saying it's okay to question even what I've brought in, what, whose perspective does this represent? And it also, it, 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 it um, I think uh, encourages uh, rigor in thinking. Whose perspective is, is shown here? How do we know whose perspective is missing and how do we bring it in? That can, that can change any lesson plan and anything that you've got in, in, in your book or on your screen. Thanks, Mariana. Sure. I don't know if we have a time, Will, but I was just gonna say that um, the great thing about ELT is that you can use any content you like to develop uh, the English language. And so there is some there are some fantastic resources out there. Um, obviously Macmillan has uh, resources, but I think someone also mentioned Oxfam in the chat. Um, and those resources that are already out there are also really helpful because you don't need to feel like you have to get to the really complex issues straight away. There's some great scaffolding out there so you can, for example, just begin by looking at reverse stereotyping to examine personal bias and so you don't have to get straight to the really complex stuff. Um, that was just my little addition I wanted to add. Great. Thanks a lot, Matt. Um, OK, so a few comments have come in uh, about a teacher's time. And um, I think generally there's a bit of a feeling of uh, I don't really have time for this. I've, I've got my materials that I need to get to. I've got my... My DOS is breathing down my neck asking how far I am in the unit and making sure I'm going to reach the end of the course book by the end of the year. Um, how would you, what would you say to the teachers that are saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have time to, to do this or even think about this? I've got loads of answers for this, but I'll keep it quite short. <laughs> um, uh, really key for me are like routines. You know, you can chuck in quick routines about the planet very easily, you know, and you can work like big numbers into that as well. So. For example, at the start of the class, you can go on to um, worldometers.info and look at the amount of CO2 that's been in, uh, gone out into the uh, atmosphere and then look again at the end of the class and then have a quick subtraction. There you go, you're working on numbers, huge numbers, um, but you're also making them aware of the amount of CO2 that's gone out in that short hour. You know, you can also just have a quick five minutes every class. Okay, today it's your day to bring in something you found about the environment, be it a photo of lots of traffic or mess on the floor or an article they've read or a super cool new influencer they're following. Um, and just to quickly come in and talk about it and make it into a quick five minute routine rather than talking about the weather or what day of the week it is again, like you've done for the last 15 years, you know, maybe do something a bit different, switch it up and not say today it's Monday and it's sunny. It's always sunny. Anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> I live in the South of Spain. It is literally always sunny. So yeah, that's, that's my idea. Just, you know, turn into a routine and, and make it a part of the lesson rather than, you know, having to stop doing what you're doing. And that other thing of the critical thinking at the end of the lesson. So how does what we've studied today affect the environment? Bam, five minutes before you leave. Everyone's got five minutes. So you don't need one really exclusive lesson that you've, you've been building for the last three months in order to deliver all of these things in one go. It's, it's woven into the fabric of the lessons. Exactly, exactly. Or you can, you know, obviously tell them there are other things outside of class that they can also work on. That doesn't all have to be in that moment. If you spark the interest in the class, then that should grow outside of the classroom, be it sustainability, be it diversity or global citizenship and so on. Cheers, Harry. Thank you. Does anyone else want to take a punt of that question as well? Is I think it can it can actually save time if you build it into a form of assessment where you're integrating the the traditional four skills. Uh, we normally, you know, in the classroom are focusing on those skills in terms of teaching, but it's a, a great way of practical assessment where students are doing something with language 
representing what they've they've discovered or learned or researched um, and it saves you time because you're not marking papers in terms of their grammar and vocabulary but you're actually focusing on their use of english and how well they use it so everything that you've taught them in the the curriculum uh, can come together in in something like a, a project thanks Irina. yeah absolutely Jessica, you want to say something? Yeah, just maybe like a quick last thing, because I, I like one thing I think is also like mainstreaming this, like a, a, as a part of like lessons and not have one big lesson on diversity, equity, inclusion or sustainability. And, and one thing that I used to do when I was a German language teacher, actually, is like I had uh, small snippets of text or poems um, that had something to do with diversity, be that by a leader or um, an activist. And we would read that at the beginning of the class instead of chit chat and then talk about it. And, and so this is like a, a five minute exercise, but it was really interesting to kind of get some discussion going. So I would also try to kind of incorporate it into many different sessions. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Mariella Matt. I was just going to, I agree with everything the panelists said, they covered it all. The uh, other thing I would say to that initial question as well is if you find yourself using a, a course book or content that you know you're spending time talking about celebrities or as Harry says you know about um, the weather today maybe it is a moment to to look at that uh, because the time with your your students is so precious and that is an opportunity to use more engaging content so it may be also worth refreshing the content you're using great thanks I have nothing to add they said <laughs> just amazing points other than Brilliant. I'm really happy to be here and I've had this opportunity. Thanks, Mariana. Um, I think that that's all we've got. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's put questions um, to the panel today um, from Facebook and from if you're watching on Zoom as well. Um, it was a wonderful discussion and just wanted to say thanks for being so communicative and engaged in the chat box. It was really great to see how much passion there is uh, in the world on these topics. Um, and I really hope you got something out of this session. That really was our aim. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Thank you to the panel that I'm looking at right now. I can't, I can't look at everyone else who's here, but I can look at you guys. I wanted to say, looking you in the eye, thank you so much for such a wonderful discussion. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and as much as the audience certainly did. Um, and well, I'll, I'll see you at five o'clock. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming to the first session. Much appreciated. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Will, and thanks everyone. Pleasure. Okay, so um, I'm going to pass over to Mariella um, quickly, and we've got something we'd like to say because today is the launch of um, a, a new programme from Macmillan Education. So I would like to share my screen, and I'm going to leave uh, Mariella to discuss this with you. Okay. So very quickly, just to... Ooh, now I can't see. Where did you all go? Okay, there it is. Um, very quickly, just to let everybody know, we're really happy to be launching Education for Sustainable Development and Citizenship within Macmillan. This is a program that we are delivering uh, through our course books, through this academic webinar uh, um, series, season, season four. Um, and we'll be bringing in, we're, we're going to be weaving in throughout um, our materials and our events, uh, global citizenship education, uh, topics that support awareness building and understanding of sustainable development goals, UNESCO's SDGs, and uh, a, a way of ensuring that we do the best job we can at delivering inclusive materials that um, will actually get you started in, in uh, or, or help you along the way if you've already started in being, having an inclusive classroom. So uh, please uh, go to the website to find out more about what we're going to be delivering. And uh, thank you for being our partners in this. Um, I know that I speak for uh, everybody at Macmillan when I say that we're, it, it, the reason we do this is because we believe in education and, and the power of education. And we take that very, very seriously. So um, yes. Please find out more about education for sustainable development and citizenship um, in the coming days. Thanks a lot, Mariella. Good stuff. Um, so as, as Mariella said, the website is just down below. So that's macmillaninenglish.com slash ESDC. That's a, that's, that couldn't be more fresh. That website went live about three hours ago. So uh, please do go and take a look at that. 
Uh, another thing I wanted to let you know about is that you will be getting a certificate. If you're watching via Facebook, there will be a link in the comments below. Uh, so if you click on the link in the, in, in the comments that, um, that we've put down there, you'll be able to still get a certificate um, if you're watching via Facebook. If you're watching on Zoom, uh, then you will get an email from us in the next few days, and that will contain a certificate, and it will contain a link to ESDC. And I just wanted to say another thanks to, to Harry Waters, who's donated uh, a, a renewable English course book. Have I got that right, Harry? Yeah, pretty much. It's all it's the collection of all of the, the first series that's already there, and it's got the, the videos and, and such on it um, for anything you need. Um, but if anyone wants to come along, it's every other Thursday uh, for the live classes. Obviously not today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah, so Harry's got a page on, on Facebook. Feel free to, to go and have a look at that, Renewable English. So that email is going to come to you in the next few days. If you want to watch this discussion again or any of the subsequent sessions we're having later on today, um, you can go to uh, the webinar archive, which is macmillanenglish.com slash webinar dash archive or there's a QR code that you can see on the screen if you scan that you'll be able to go straight there we've already got lots of stuff on there for you uh, the other thing I want to tell you about is that today is actually a very special day for several reasons firstly it's the first time we've had a round table and especially with this group of wonderful people here um, but it's also uh, the opening session for advancing uh, advancing for advancing learning academic program season four um, as Mariella uh, pertains to a second ago, um, we're going to be talking about all, all of the issues that you've heard about today throughout the season, um, as well as all sorts of other things uh, which you might be interested in learning about, listening to about, uh, watching. Uh, we're covering those issues, that, those areas that you can see on screen. So we've got advancing students' global skills, advancing inclusivity, advancing assessment for the future, advancing digital teaching skills, advancing teaching skills, uh, and the newbie this year is advancing well-being. Um, so please do go take a look at uh, the website. Uh, you'll find all sorts of materials that we've already developed that you can go and have a look at and learn from now. Um, and also what you can do is follow us on, as you can see, LinkedIn. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook. Scan the QR codes and that'll go straight to the groups. Um, also, if you would like to say anything or give your opinion on via any of those channels at any point, feel free to add the hashtag uh, teach English or hashtag advancing learning um, and we can get involved in the discussion with you hopefully. Um, so as I said season four has started officially we're going to be giving you webinars roughly every two weeks or so for the rest of the, um, the season up until sort of May, June next year we'll have a session every few weeks. Um, so we've, we've got coming up our first webinar next week from Lorena Pembert talking about phonics in pre-primary uh, and then a few weeks after that, we've got Lucy Crichton talking about uh, confident communication from uh, reception, production, all the way to confident communication. Um, that's looking at young learners. Uh, again, scan the QR code or go to macmillanenglish.com and you'll find it easily enough to register for those webinars now if you want to come along. Uh, and I think that's about it. That's, that's all I've got to say. Um, apart from thank you again to, every, to all of the panelists. Thank you to everyone who's come along today. Also, I want to say a, a very special thank you to uh, Daria Hojina, who uh, is, she can't, you can't see her, you can't see her right now, not yet you can't see her, but she is there in the background, she's like this ghost or puppeteer, I don't know what you want to call her, but she is there and she is the one pulling all the strings, uh, and we couldn't have got here without your help, Daria, Daria, so thank you so much for all of your support so far, and I can't wait to do season four with you, it's going to be great fun, really can't wait. Um, so, I think that's about it, I'm going to stop babbling. I'll see you everyone else at five o'clock. If you want to come back, please do. See you all soon. Bye-bye.